Okay, Matrix, we are going to go through the February, March 2017 paper. We're doing question one today. Okay, so question one is your multiple choice question. I'm not going to read through the instructions, but please, when you do these papers, read through the instructions carefully and follow them. For question 1.1.1, after sperm cells have been produced in humans, they are stored in the what until maturation, until they matured. Now, your sperm cells are produced in the seminal vesicles, but that's not where they're stored. They are stored in the epididymis. So, for this question, you need to know the male reproductive organs, the diagram, and then your labels and then the function and that's the best way to study it as well if you have uh, notes that you make that's got the diagram and the label and together with the label you're going to have the functions for each of the different parts 1.1.2 which one of the following parts in the diagram of a sperm cell contains a haploid number of chromosomes and that's going to be your nucleus your nucleus which is number three number three is the correct answer the nucleus know the functions of the sperm very well uh, it's a it's a it's a very common question to ask to draw the sperm and to lay or to label the sperm or to give the functions or how the sperm is adapted to its function which means that when we discuss the adaptation to its function we're talking about the fact that it's small. We're talking about that so that it can move very easily. We're talking about the fact that it's got an acrosome. Acrosome. The acrosome's got digestive enzymes which are going to eat away the outside layers of the egg cell. It's got a neck with lots of mitochondria because it's got a swim. It needs a lot of energy because it needs a lot of energy it needs to respirate and because it needs to respirate it's got a lot of mitochondria in the neck area and lastly it's got a tail why does it have a tail so that it can swim towards the egg cell so very uh, nice question to ask is the functions of the sperm or how the sperm is adapted to its function 1.1.3 which one of the following plant hormones is responsible for the germination of seeds so that is your gibberlins gibberlins is responsible for the germination of seeds growth hormone is a human hormone abscisic acid you'll see is responsible for like for, uh, when leaves are being cut it's called the cutting enzyme uh, during uh, autumn for example when leaves are falling from the trees they use abscisic acid Auxin is used for plant growth, but gibberlins will be the cause for the germination of seeds. So these are the three plant hormones you have to know. Um, you have to know for each of one what their function is. So each one, you're going to make yourself a table. That's the best way to study. Make yourself a table and tell me which is the hormone and what is their functions. And each of them have several functions and they differ according to where they are in the plant and they even differ according to how they respond in different plants. 1.1.4 The phase in mitosis in which individual centromeres split in which the individual centromeres split so remember when we talk about the centromere and we talk about a replicated chromosome it's when that centromere splits and then of course those two chromosomes are going to move to chromatids we used to be now it's going to be chromosomes daughter chromosomes are going to move to opposite ends of the of the cells the cell poles and so that happens during anaphase two that happens during anaphase two in anaphase one that's where they're trying to trick you in anaphase one we're going to, to take the whole chromosome, whole replicated chromosome. It's not going to split and move to one end because there was homologous pairs present. And so they move to opposite poles. But in anaphase 2, it splits and then becomes the chromatids become daughter chromosomes and move to opposite poles of the cell. 
1.1.5 when Jane plays in the snow her body maintains a constant core temperature by okay so this is about homeostasis homeostasis this is the lesson on homeostasis so we need to now take a look at what happens at um, at what's going to happen to try and keep her temperature inside to keep a temperature because she's cold on the outside so we have to make the, bo uh, the body warmer on the inside so uh, we're going to have shivering what's what's shivering going to cause shivering is going to cause that uh, muscles are moving and as it moving is creating uh, kinetic energy and kinetic energy will then cause the body to warm up we're not going to sweat. We're not going to sweat because sweating cools down. So sweating is out. Sweating is totally out. So A and C can't apply. Um, we can't have vasoconstriction and vasodilation. Those are two opposites of one another. Vasoconstriction, when the, the blood vessels become smaller and doesn't let blood through, vasodilation when they become bigger and they do let blood through. So the correct answer in this case is B, vasoconstriction and shivering. So how does vasoconstriction stop uh, us from losing temperature? So if this is the skin, and um, this is a blood vessel that's close to the skin then what's going to happen is that we're going to lose heat from that blood and by narrowing the blood vessel i'm letting less blood into that vessel and less blood coming close to the skin and less blood being lost uh, via uh, conduction of the heat 1.1.6 which one of the following hormones prepares the human body to react to emergency situations? So that's your flight and fight hormone, and that is adrenaline. So 1.1.6 is adrenaline. It's your flight and fight hormone. Again, with the hormones, it may be good to, when you study your hormones, good to set up a table, and in your table with your hormones, you say, you can say, what is the hormone? Uh, what produces the hormone, what organ produces the hormone, what is the target organ, and what is the function. And study it that way. Set up yourself a little table for your human hormones when you study them. Now question 1.1.7 and 1.8 .8 refer to the investigation below. An investigation was carried out to determine the fertility levels, so this is about reproduction, fertility levels of healthy males in different age groups. The procedure follow, uh, which uh, was as follows, followed was as follows, 50 healthy males in each of, so there's a lot, there's a repetition of the experiment, 50 healthy males. With that repetition, ladies and gentlemen, I'm getting my, my results to be more reliable. I repeat my results, I repeat my experience so that they're more reliable. And then also, they're telling you that they're all 50 healthy. Healthy makes it more valid. It, it talks to the validity. That, that can be a... a that's a control variable because it's got a, an impact on the results. A less healthy person would not be uh, um, able to produce as much sperm, so it will cause it will cause problems, um, and it will have an effect on the results. And that's what I'm what I'm testing for. I'm not testing about the health of the person. I'm testing about the age of the person. Okay. In each of the following age groups, we're asked to participate 20 to 29, 30 to 39, 40 to 49, 50 to 59, and 60 to 69. Now, when you get a set of results on this, just uh, remember that if they ask you to do a graph on a results like this, you're going to then use a histogram. Now, a histogram we use when we've got a number on the x-axis, we've got a number on our independent variable, uh, but that number is grouped. Then semen was collected from each of uh, from each for each of the males. I'm going to talk about the procedure there of how it's collected, rather not. The the number of active sperm cells pre present in the semen was counted for each man, and each age group and averages were calculated. 
Then, which one of the following is the dependent variable in this investigation? That's the sperm count, the number of active sperm. So the number of active sperm was counted. Um, yes, the number of at the yes, yes, the number of active sperm was counted. So that's my dependent variable, number of active sperm. So that is C, number of active sperm, 1.1.7 C. Then, 1.1.8, which one of the following variables was kept constant during this investigation? We said the health of the females. H group wasn't kept constant, we had different H group. Number of active sperm was measured, so that's not constant. Uh, fertility levels of males in each group? No, number of participants in each H group. Okay, so they don't have that it's healthy males. Um, so what the constant variable over here is, they say, is the number of participants in each age group was kept constant. One point, one point nine, and one point, one point ten refer to the graph below. The graph shows the changes in the concentration of females of uh, female hormones LH and FSH, luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone. So we're talking about the menstrual cycle here in two females, uh, females during the first two weeks of the menstrual cycle. So we just typically see the numbers that we uh, usually see. Um, in terms of FSH that increases, increases and then in female B, take a note, it doesn't increase, it stays plus minus constant but in female A there is a definite difference in, in the amount of FSH produced. LH is typical what it's doing always both male and uh, both A and B females um, in the middle of the menstrual cycle they had a peak of LH which would cause the release of the the excel called and the, that process is called ovulation which female will not ovulate on day 14 okay which female will not ovulate on day 14 okay most probably female b um, and the female b why female b ladies and gentlemen it says to me that in female B, uh, because the follicle did not develop, the follicle did not develop, so there's no XL2 release. LH was there, but the follicle did not develop. And LH does not inhibit the development of the follicle. It really, the, um, uh, it, but in this case, not enough FSH was present, and so that's why there was no XL2 release. 1.1.10, which one of the following statements is correct regarding female A? So let's take a look. In female A, um, it says FSH increased, uh, increases on day 14. No, it increased before the time. So that's not correct. FSH increases after day 9 as the pituitary gland hypothesis is secreting progesterone. No, 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 no. Uh, the, the, the progesterone is not being secreted by, the, if, uh, by, uh, by my hypothesis. Uh, progesterone, progesterone is secreted by the ovaries. Then it says FSH decreases after day four to ensure that implantation occurs. No, we're not even close to implantation on day four yet. Implantation only happens after day 14, after the middle of the month, uh, after the exile has been released. And FSH has nothing to do with implantation. Then the last one says to us, FSH increases in the two, first two days to stimulate the development of the follicle and that is the correct one so d is your correct answer in 1.1.10 okay so question 1.2 give the correct biological term for each of the following descriptions right i need the term next to the question number in the answer book remember with question 1.2 that you need to get the spelling correct. In this question, you need to get the spelling correct. If you have the spelling correct, uh, incorrect in this question, you don't get the marks. In the rest of the paper, um, only if the, it changes the meaning of the word, 
do we mark spanning? But um, in this question, we need to mark spanning because it's terminology. The dipwood cell formed by the process of fertilization is called a zygote. So it's when the sperm cell and the egg cell meet. So when my sperm cell and my egg cell meet, that's fertilization, and then they fuse, then we call it a zygote. Notice that they ask you, what is the cell? They could ask you, what is the process? And um, if it's the process, it's fertilization. Um, then 1.2.2, the fluid that protects the human embryo against injuries and large-scale temperature changes. So that's my amniotic fluid, amniotic fluid. That's the function of the amniotic fluid. Ladies and gentlemen, so when we take a look at the, the baby that's developing inside the uterus, then around the baby there's an amnion fluid, and that's, there's my little fetus, umbilical cord, placenta there, and this fluid inside the amnion, it's called the amniotic fluid, and one of the fu functions of amniotic fluid is to, uh, to just keep a more t even temperatures. So the temperature changes from the outside of mommy's body or the outside, on the outside of mommy's body, doesn't affect the baby inside as much because it's a buffer to the temperature on the inside. And also, when something bumps against mommy's stomach, then that fluid acts as a shock absorber for that bump. So it protects the baby in that way. A disorder of the nervous system that is characterized by the breakdown of the myelin sheath in neurons, uh, that is multiple sclerosis, multiple sclerosis, so commonly known as MS, but you can't just say MS here, you need to write it out, so multiple sclerosis. breaking down the myelin sheath on the outside of the neurons. Now remember what the myelin sheath is. If I take a look at a motor neuron over there, that's my axon, uh, and there's my endpoint, and then there's this Schwann cells on the outside of this axon, and those are the ones that break down during multiple sclerosis, which means that the, the relay of my my messages that speeds up the messages that's being transferred from one neuro uh, from down the axon and so um, if that doesn't happen we don't have as much control over our nervous system as we want to so that then question 1.2.4 a hormone produced by the pituitary gland hypothesis that stimulates milk production in human females that's prolactin prolactin Think of uh, lactic acid. Lactic acid is milk acid. Um, lactose, I'm lactose intolerant because um, I don't have the enzymes to break down milk. So prolactin, lactin indicates milk, and pro means it's pro milk. It's, it's yes for milk. So that is the hormone that is going to cause milk production uh, or activate milk production in the mammary glands. Having access to enough food on a daily basis to ensure a healthy living, that is of course food security. That is not the full definition of food security. It will be good if you go and memorize the full definition for food security. It's one that is commonly asked. So this is food security. Ladies and gentlemen, so having access to enough food in day, on a daily basis so all the time to ensure healthy living, um, that, those are three of the elements of food security. 1.2.6, the blood vessel in the umbilical cord that transports nutrients to the fetus, that is the umbilical vein, umbilical vein, umbilical vein transports uh, nutrients to the fetus. Uh, what's weird about when we talk about the umbilical vein and the umbilical um, arteries is that they are turned around. The umbilical vein will also transport oxygen to the baby. Normally we associate arteries with transporting oxygen, but now it's the umbilical vein transporting oxygen and nutrients instead of the artery as in the rest of the normal body. 
1.2.7, a part of the neuron that conducts impulses towards the cell body, towards, that's the trick, towards, towards says to me it's a dendrite, it's a dendrite. If it was going away from the neuron, if it's moving the signal away, the impulse away from the neuron, then it would have been an axon, but this is a dendrite. Then question 1.2.8. A disease that results from the body's inability to produce insulin, yeah, and you learned that already in grade 11, that's diabetes, diabetes, uh, or also called diabetes mellitus, in full. Okay, let's move on to question 1.3. 1.3.0 is your A and B question. Remember always to go, uh, follow the instructions. If it's A, you need to write A only. If it's B, you need to write B only. If it's both A and B, you need to write both A and B. And of course, if it's none, uh, you need to write none. You can't just write A. You need to write A only. You can't just write B. You need to write B only. 1.3.1. The hormone that is in excess in a person that grows abnormally tall, that's growth hormone, growth hormone, so it's none of these, none of these two, so none. 1.3.2, the part of the autonomic nervous system that consists of, uh, that controls involuntary actions, and then you have one, you have one speeding up reactions, one slowing down reactions, you have the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. Now, so it's, it's both of them. It's both A and B in this case. So both A and B. And this one was that. Okay, so 1.3.3. The woman that controls the salt content in the human body is not adrenaline. <coughs> it's aldosterone. Now, both of these are produced by the bi kidneys. Both of these are produced by the adrenal glands. But the one controlling the salt is B. So you need to write B only. Don't forget to write the only. So people question 1.4. The diagram below shows the phases of my a phase of my hosis in an animal cell. So let's just quickly identify the different parts. This is your centriole, centriole in A. Then we have a chromosome, a replicated chromosome in B. And it used to be, in the previous phase, we would have said this is a, homo a homologous chromosomal pair, but now it's a single, um, it's now a single replicated chromosome because it's already split and went to opposite poles. Ladies and gentlemen, then we have C, which is your centromere. These two are the two, in terms of terms, that we normally confuse, centromere and centriole. Please don't confuse them. And you have to have the correct spelling for each of them because these two are commonly swapped around. Be careful of that. Centriole for A and centromere for C. Identify the parts A, so that was your centriole. Identify parts B, that is your uh, chromosome, a um, uh, replicated chromosome. Please, you can't say chromosome P because they've already split up and you cannot say uh, a chromatid because a chromatid is only one side of it it's only the bottom or the top side of it and let's quickly while we're discussing that let's take a look at which phase this is this is anaphase one why because it was still pairs that are now split um, because the centromere did not split into and made sister chromosomes yet sister chromosomes yet from the chromatids Identified part C, that is your centromere. Which phase of meiosis is illustrated in the diagram below? Above, as I said to you, anaphase one, and always remember to include that one, otherwise it's wrong. Um, it's not anaphase two because it is not splitting up the centromere yet and taking the different chromatids, which become sister chromosomes, to different ends. Or daughter, not sister chromosomes, daughter chromosomes to the different ends yet. We also call it unreplicated chromosomes then. Then, uh, name the phase that follows the one represented in the diagram above. So, you think always about your little rhyme, IP mat, IP on the mat. 
So it's interface, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase. And in the case of meiosis, this happens twice. So you have this one, 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 and one, and then two, 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 and two. So in this case, this is telophase one. That's going to follow after anaphase one. How many chromosomes were there in the cell before the process of meiosis began? Okay, so there's one, two, three, four. How many are there going to be afterwards? Is probably the next question. Afterwards, there's going to be two. It goes from four to two because it goes from diploid to haploid. And before it started, is one, two, three, four. The cell hasn't split once yet. In the next phase, it's going to split and there's going to be a division and then there's going to be two. Then it's going to turn into that from diploid into haploid. There's four, four chromosomes over here when it starts off there's going to be two afterwards remember you need to read your question very carefully are they asking you before or after meiosis and in which phase is it that that's going to determine that answer what is the specific name given to meiosis when it takes place in the human female we call it OO genesis OO genesis OO genesis the genesis genesis means start the start of the ovum of genesis. Okay, so our last question for question one. Um, question 1.5 is a question on the eye. The diagram below represents a section through the human eye. Then 1.5.1 A, they want you to give the um, identify A, the label for A, that is the sclera. Sclera is the outside layer of the eye. And then uh, B, B is your cornea. Cornea. Cornea is part of the sclera. It's a clear part of the sclera that's in front of the, the eye. And then C, ladies and gentlemen, C is the pupil. It's that hole in between the iris, in between the iris, in the middle of the iris, the black part of your eye. So that is your pupil. Give the letter and the name of the part that regulates the amount of light entering the eye. Okay, the one that regulates the amount of light entering the eye is D. Yes, the light enters through C, but the one controlling the amount of light is the iris around the eye. So that is D. So if we look at the eye, and that's the pupil, and then the colored part of the eye is the iris, and it's got the radial and circular muscles, and so that is the part that controls the size of the pupil. So that's why the answer is D, the iris. And remember now, with this, they ask you the letter and the name. Don't give the name if they ask you the letter. Don't give the letter if they ask you the name. And both give the letter and the name if they ask the letter and the name. So this is D. You get one mark for D and you get one mark for iris. Then contains a dark pigment that absorbs excess light in the eye. That is your choroid. Choroid. And it's the bottom, it's the layer below the sclera. So that is G, G, the choroid. G, the choroid. So G, choroid. You get a, a mark for G and a mark for choroid. C, please don't write as ugly as me. Um, uh, if, you, if you scribble like I'm scribbling at the moment, they're not going to give you the mark. So please don't write as ugly as I am at the moment. Then, C, contains receptors that are sensitive to light. Receptors that are sensitive to light. That it will be the retina. And over here, the retina is marked as E. Be careful with the retina uh, and where they, where they actually label the retina. The retina actually stretches for a very long distance. And I'm just going to use a different color here just to show that to you. Let me use now, and I'm going to use red. Let me use yellow. And the retina actually stretches for quite a bit at the back of the eye. So sometimes they even label it down here. So the retina is quite big and it's at the back of the eye. And so that's the retina or E. You will get one mark for, you'll get one mark for E. Let me just get ready here. One more for E and one more for retina. 
And that is question one of the 2017 February March paper. Guys, continue uh, finishing this paper so we can discuss the rest of the questions. Thank you.